Good stuff. So for, for everyone, whether you were here last time or whether you weren't here, um, what I'm going to be doing every week is I'm going to be taking a individual topic okay that's going to be that, that, that will be obviously from this subject um and i'm going to work through kind of a question okay or a set of questions i'm going to try and steer clear of um the material that is kind of provided by kind of first intuition just on the basis that I know some of you will have already done some of those questions. Um, you know, you, you might be planning to use our folders for revision in those kind of last few weeks running up to the exam. And so I don't really want to be kind of like redoubling up with other work that you've already done. So I'm gonna be trying to find kind of some alternative questions. They might be old AAT questions from kind of like a few years back. They might be questions that I found from kind of other syllabus. There might be questions that I've kind of that I've created myself that I'd like you to take a look at. So on each Tuesday we'll together, we'll go through a question or maybe a couple of questions. I'll kind of give you tips about how I would be attacking the questions in the exam or how I'd answer them or how to kind of give you, um, you know, how to up, uh, uplift the mark that you would achieve. So there'll be a topic with a question. What I will then do is after the session is I will email everyone a recording of what we went through. Okay, so that's gonna be a recording of the hour that we're together here, which will go through the question that we attempted, kind of any tips that I've got, my workings all the way through it, answering any questions that you've got as we go through. Okay, I will also, as part of that email, Okay, I will also send next week's questions. Okay, now, what I'd then be looking for you to do is over the next week or so, for you to look at that question, and if you want to attempt it, perfect. And um, if you want to use that as a trigger for your revision, so if I send you a question next week and you can see there's loads of, um, or, or this, this, it, that's one of the requirements is asking you to calculate return on capital employed, well, what you might want to do is go to your notes and just do a little review of what return on capital employed is. Okay, or if I'm asking you more variance questions next time, you might have to do a little review, that's one we'll look at next time. So that's really the pattern of what we're going to do every week, is there'll be a question, okay, maybe two questions, I'll be working them through, through them with you. I'll send you a recording once we finish. I'll send you next week's question and we'll be back next Tuesday to go through that question. So that's kind of like the, I guess, the three-step approach that we've got. Now, those of you that were here last week, um, I know that, oh, Lauren, just got someone that is in the waiting room. So those of you that were here last week will know that um, I gave you kind of an introduction to this exam. So we talked a little bit through the different questions that you're going to get in the exam. Um, and I, I went through um, a, a, a question that was kind of similar in content to the kind of question that you'll get in question number one of this exam. Um, it was quite a nice question about standard costing, a little bit of kind of um, over under absorption of overheads and, and things like that. And I said that what I wanted to look at today was I wanted to look at some questions around variances. Because we know in this exam, variances are, are gonna be a massive part of the exam. We know that you're gonna to have to calculate some variances. Okay. And there's gonna be a written question about variances. And uh, I've had, over the last week or so, I've had some people that have emailed me to say, can I have a copy of the recording? What are we going to be doing next week? And things like that. And then I have had some people asking me kind of very specific questions. And the specific questions are always around, you know, the written elements of the exam. So where I'm having problems with the exam is the written element, or I can never work out what to write. Or when I put down a written answer to an exam, it's completely different to the model solution. Uh, and uh, I think that's probably in my experience where most people you know, tend to not necessarily fall down in terms of marks, but where most people tend to be quite unsure uh, uh, as to kind of how to complete those questions. I think it's perfectly understandable. We all 
chose to become accountants normally because we quite like numbers, not because we like writing essays or like doing bits of writing. So I will you know, come up with and kind of go through tips that I have for how to attack written questions. But I did set you last time two questions, or I said that there were two questions that we were gonna be, be working through so we're looking at today. Um, and those of you that were here last time were able to download them from the chat. Um, I know some people, I emailed those questions out to you to, for you to take a look at. Um, if, if you didn't, I'm gonna show them on screen. And um, when I, I'm happy, I'm gonna work through it. Um, if you wanna just watch me work through it, that's fine. Um, if you wanna take notes kind of as you go through, or if you wanna motor ahead and practice your things, then you can refer back to time, that's absolutely fine. Um, next time, as I say, I'll send out this recording with the questions for next week. So there were two questions that I had, and one was labeled question two, and one was labeled question six. And there were both questions that were taken from kind of quite old AAT exams when the syllabus was slightly different to the syllabus that we've got now. Or I should say the structure of the exam was very different. The syllabus was largely the same. And the question that I want to look at to start with is I'm going to have a look at question number six. Okay, so question number six was the written question. Um, if I get time, okay, then um, I'll take a look at question number two. Okay, but I, I'm thinking that depending on the questions that you have, I may end up just looking at question six today. Okay, and then question two may be something we carry through till next time, or it might be something that we look at kind of, uh, I, I do kind of some slightly different way of feeding it back to you, because I, I am conscious that we're here from seven till eight, um, and um, at kind of eight o'clock, I know that you guys might have plans. I do know that some of you have got children and might be wanting to put children to bed and things like that, so I don't want to take up more of your evening okay, than, than you are currently committed to. So question number six, that's the one we're gonna take a look at first. I've got it on a different tab here. Some of you might have it in front of you. Some of you may have already, um, uh, already attempted this question. So task number six, this is, yeah. I say a written question, I don't think it's completely written. There are some calculations that we need to do. So it says here, you've been provided pro, um, with the following information for an organization which manufactures a product called Bex for the month just ended. We've got some information about this product. Okay, and it says the requirement, the bit in black at the bottom, says, can we prepare a note explaining the total direct material variance and how it can be split into a price variance and a usage variance. It's then got this bit here where it says, calculation should be used to illustrate the explanation. Okay, now one of the, the, the first things, and, the, and I, I obsess about this load, so anyone that's been in my classes before will already have heard me talk about this, so anyone that's, that's kind of been to my classes in Norwich or my classes in Chelmsford will have heard me say that when I read the requirement of a question, there is one word in questions that I think is the single most misunderstood question in any exam question. And people always laugh at me when I tell them what it is, um, but I've seen so many people misunderstand what this word means, okay? And the word is this word here, and. Okay, it sounds straightforward, okay? But the word and means you've got something to do before the word and, and something after the word and. Okay, now what some people seem to think the word and means is some people think the word and means full stop, the question ends here, you don't need to do anything else. Uh, and what they'll do is they'll do everything up to an and, and then they'll stop and they won't do anything else. So what I always tend to do is if I'm doing something kind of a, a written question where I'm actually handwriting it, I put a circle around the ant and say, right, I've got one thing to do here. I've got another thing to do here. There's another ant here. I've got a third thing to do here. So suddenly I've got three things to do. I've also kind of underlined this bit here, where it says calculations should be used to illustrate the explanation. So when we do our explanation of each of those three things, we should be thinking, is there 
some kind of calculation that I can do to help to support each of those three different explanations. Okay, now one of the nice things with doing this is you kind of go to the top here where it says, right, the AAT work for this question giving 22 marks. Now 22 marks to me sounds like a ridiculous number of marks. I'm thinking, can I write for 22 marks? That sounds like a small essay and I hate writing essays. But if I start thinking, well, they're asking me to do, you know, we said here, was it one, two, three things? Well, 22 marks shared between three different requirements is what, well, that's roughly kind of seven marks each. You know, seven marks each would be 21. That's, a, that's about the 22. And then if you think that they're asking you to, for seven marks, explain with a calculation, well, they've got to give you credit for calculation. They've got to give you credit for the explanation. Suddenly now I'm thinking, well, is this four marks for my explanation and three marks for my calculation? Can I write for four marks? Well, four marks is a lot more manageable than 22 marks worth of writing. So just by reading that requirement, we start to break down these big written questions into smaller chunks. And smaller chunks are much, much easier for me to answer. So I'm, I'm straight away splitting my question up into three little bits rather than one big bit. Okay, so prepare a note, explain the direct material variance, how it can be split into a price variance, how it can be split into a usage variance. And then let, let's look back up at what the narrative tells me. So I've been provided this information. I've got some budget information and some actual information. Okay. It then says, the finance director has asked you to write a note to help in the training of a junior accountant technician. These notes are to explain the calculation of the total direct material variance, so total direct material variance, and how it can be split into a price and a usage variance. Okay, so it says here we're talking to a junior accounting technician so my assumption is that what well, we are a senior accounting technician and we've got someone in our team who's at a very junior level who doesn't understand any of these variances so what we need to do is we need to show them and explain to them why we're doing these calculations we need to explain how these calculations work now, one of the things that I always bear in mind is when you have a written question, your written question is going to be marked by a person. Okay, so most of the exams are marked by a computer. And when the person looks at your written answer, they don't have the benefit of, first of all, knowing who you are. They don't have the benefit of seeing the rest of your exam. So you can have been amazing on you know task one task two task three really brilliant really good answers you've got everything calculated correctly but your marker doesn't see that all your marker sees is what's written on the page or what's typed into the box in your exam so that's all they've got to judge your knowledge so when you get these questions where you have to explain a calculation and explain why you do something I always think that it's better to err on the side of caution and explain it in just a little bit more detail. And the, the, the thing that I kind of always do is I, I apply after I've done it, the my mum test. Okay, now my mum is not an accountant. Okay, she doesn't know anything about accountancy whatsoever. So I almost imagine that I'm talking to my mum. And if I think my mum would understand what I've written, then I've probably pitched it at the right level. Okay, so I know that we're all used to speaking to accountants and we speak a certain language, but imagine the examiner doesn't speak that language. Okay, and then what are we going to write? Okay, so what we've got here is we've got this table where we've got what budget versus actual figures. And now the first thing we can know is that the budget is based on 20,000 units. 
and it says that the budget for 20,000 units is what, 80,000 kilograms. I could do a quick calculation there, so I'm just gonna whip my calculator out and say what, 80,000 kilograms divided by 20,000 units. It's the right number, 20,000. Okay, I just gonna write it in here. That is a total of what, four kilograms per unit. Okay, and it's just the way that I tend to think of things is I'm always kind of like looking at those numbers as I go through, you know, just because I know that they're, they're going to help me a little bit later on. I've got um, the materials are 880,000 pounds of the budgeted cost. So if I just do quickly 880,000 pounds divided by 80,000 kilograms, I've got a cost there I've just worked out of 11 pounds per kilogram. Okay, so just a little calculation that I've done. I'll be doing that on a little piece of paper, kind of on my, on my kind of like workings, just as I read through. And the finance director asked me to write a note to help uh, with training them to explain the calculation of the total direct material variance. So that the first part, let's do this in a different color, is my total. direct material variance. Cool, okay. So total direct material variance is when we look at what our actual material costs, how much we spent on materials, and we compare it with what the budgeted costs for that level of production should be. And if we remember, when we calculate direct material variance, it's always about what the flexed budget amount of expenditure versus actual. Okay, so uh, this is something I would note on kind of a rough piece of working rather than actually in my answer. I'm just gonna do it in a different color to show you that this is what my thought process is. So do total direct material variance is what my flexed, budget versus actual. Okay, so a few people are entering the room. Okay, now I know that's how I calculate my total direct material variance. But if I'm explaining that to, what, to, to my junior accounting technician, okay, the my mum test, okay, my mum is not gonna understand what I mean by the flex budget versus actual. Okay, she's gonna get confused straight away. She's gonna say, well, you've got a budget figure up there, why don't you use that budget figure? Okay, now we know we don't use this budget figure because it is set at 20,000 units. Okay, we know that that budget was what our original plan. Okay, and it's brilliant from the point of view of planning what we were going to do, but it's not so good when we're comparing it with actual. So I need to explain to my mum, or I need to explain to my junior accounting technician, okay, why it is that I need to do this flexing activity. Okay, so the first point, and the way I'm gonna attack this is I'm gonna show you kind of how I would structure the answer. Okay, I'm not gonna write out an answer in full, because if I go through how I'm gonna do it and write it out in full, it's gonna take us a long time. Okay, in your exam, this is the thought process I would go through. Okay, and I'll give you kind of rough points that I would talk about. So first thing that I would talk about, okay, is I would explain that we can't, or actually no, I'll do it, not way, actually, I'll slightly different words. So I would say the budget set for 20,000 units, I'll say was, because it was done in the past, was prepared for planning purposes. But can't be used to evaluate performance
as it's, or as we actually produced more units. And it's what more units of X. Okay, now it's, it's something that I always do is that I always try and put into the question kind of something from the narrative. Okay, so if I'm telling the, if I just write down that we actually produce more units, the examiner sits there and says, well, you know, if you just copied a definition from somewhere. But if the examiner sees that I'm actually picking up the name of the units or the name of the people or the name of the material, and then the examiner suddenly gets a little more confidence that I really understand what's going on here. Okay, so you know, the budget is set for 20,000 units but prepared for planning purposes, can't be used to evaluate performance as we actually produce more units of X. Okay, so to work out if we have spent more or less on material and we should, we need to calculate a new, I'm just gonna put it in brackets here, flexed budget. Okay, so I'm telling the examiner that I need to produce this new flexed budget. Okay. And could say this budget will show the expected cost to produce the actual level of production or the actual production. Okay, and then you can do a for example. Okay, so for example, for example. Okay, so for example here, actual production is 21,000 units. Okay, the budgeted cost per unit, well that was, we said, four kilograms per unit at a price of 11 pounds. So that is 44 pounds per unit. So what I'm doing is I'm just building the picture, okay? So I'm now telling my, my accounts junior, we actually made 21,000, you know, the budget was 44 pounds per unit. So that production, as you know, so the total cost of production should have been, if I do 21,000, times 44, I mean that should have been 924,000 pounds. Now, that's the cost to make 21,000. Now what I can do, I say now, we can compare versus actual. My actual costs what nine five four five hundred. So we can see that there is a difference, and that difference is thirty thousand five hundred, and that's in pounds. Okay, so now I've told you know my you know I've told my accounts accounts junior this is the calculation that I do. 
Okay, difference is £30,500. Okay, now, one of the challenges, and this is the challenge that we saw, that I mentioned last time, so those of you here last time would have seen me talk about this or heard me talk about this, is that one thing that examiners don't like is you just calculating a number and not really explaining that you understand that number. And the thing I looked at last time is the examiners hate you saying things like this went up or this went down. Okay, what they want to see is something has improved, something has got better. And I think last time I talked about the example of, you know, if, if you've got bank accounts and you can say that, you know, my bank balance went up, okay, well, you know, bank balance is going up, okay, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it, it depends. You know, my current account going up is good. My overdraft going up is not so good. Okay, and just saying something goes up isn't a good thing. My bank balance has improved. Well, that tells me I've either got more money in my bank account, in my current account, or my overdraft is reduced. So, so improved tells me a lot more than deteriorated, sorry, than, than gone up or gone down. And likewise, if something has, is, has not improved, we will say it deteriorates. Okay, so being able to understand you know, what those numbers mean okay, is something the examiner is quite keen on. And here we've got, so now if we can compare versus actual, we've got this difference of 30,500. Okay, now what I can see here is that my budget said 924,000. I've actually spent 954,500. The difference is 30,500, and that difference is an amount that we have overspent. Okay, we've overspent, we've spent too much money. Okay, so this difference will have a negative impact on the profit of the business. So we can say this is a negative impact on the profit of the business. Okay, and this is what we refer to as an adverse variance. Okay, so it's adverse in nature. Adverse, what negative variance, it's no negative impact on profit. Excellent, okay. So what I've done here is I've kind of gone through just that first part. Prepare a note explaining the total material variance. Okay, now I've come up with, and I've listed what? One, two, three, what? One, two, three different points that I've made in terms of writing. I've done, what, a calculation here. I've done a calculation here. Okay, now I'm expecting those calculations to be carrying marks. Okay, I think at least I've got five separate things. Worst case, is that actually now I've got this bit here as well and I've explained that this has got a negative impact on profit and it's adverse. So I'm thinking that I've got six separate points. Some of them are quite big calculations. Okay, I've got to be looking at getting six marks there. Okay, maybe, you know, I could squeeze more marks out of it. Okay, but I'm thinking definitely six marks there. You know, it might be a couple of marks for the calculation that might take it up to seven. Okay, now what a lot of people will do is when they'll see the note where it says, explain the total direct material variance, loads of people will just go straight down to this here and say, and the variance is adverse. Okay, now has that explained the variance? Has it explained the calculations? It explained why you've done it? Has it passed the my mum test? Okay, my mum would not understand those calculations at the bottom unless we did some of the work at the top. Okay, so hopefully we're okay with that first part. Okay, I, I, I personally think that that first part, a lot of people struggle with, okay? Because a lot of people want to go straight into calculation, they don't want to go into the narrative. Now, what I would then look at is that, you know, that 30,500 pounds, okay? So overall, what we've said here is that, let me just write it up. We had the, what was it, the total, actually, let's get rid of red, I don't like the red there. Let's do it in black. So total material variance, and we just said it was 30,500 pounds adverse. Okay, and I said that this means that we have spent more on materials Than budget. 
Okay. So one of the questions that I, I always ask my class whenever we get to this point is I say, okay, so you've spent more money on materials than you thought you were going to. And you were making a product, and I always talk about cakes. Okay, so you're making a load of cakes, and you've just found out that you spent more money on sugar than you thought you should have done when you're baking your cakes. Now, why is it you could have spent more money on sugar than you thought? Okay, and really, okay, there's only two reasons. Okay, so you know, it means we spent more money on materials than budget. Okay, and you know, there are really two reasons for this. Okay, number one reason is what the materials cost more or less than expected. Okay, so number one is the materials cost more or less than expected. I went to the shop to buy my sugar and it was more expensive than I thought it was going to be. So no wonder I spent more on materials, they just cost more. Okay, or it could be that I ended up using more or less materials. Okay, use more or less materials. So I, I expected to use 10 kilos of sugar to make all the cakes that I wanted to make. I ended up using 11 or I ended up using nine. Okay, that's the only reason. They're the only reasons why I could have a material variance. So either use more or I spent more. Okay, I've used less or I've spent less. It's all to do with either okay, they cost a different amount or we use a different amount. Okay, so that's the, the, the bit that I would then talk about. Now, I would put this part in the first part. Some people might put it later on. Okay, but ultimately, I've calculated my total variance, the total amount that I've spent more on materials than expected. And now I'm saying that it's one of two reasons. Okay, or it's a mixture of both of them. I've used a different amount or I've spent a different amount than I expected to. And that's what the next two parts of the question are about. Because then it says, how can it be split into a price variance and a usage variance. Okay, so we can say that you know th there are only two reasons. It either it costs more, and if we look at number one, the materials cost more or less. Well, that is the price variance. Okay. And secondly, we turn on the second page. If we used more or less, well, that is the usage variance. And as we saw from that first part, you know, where I said total direct material variance, I made a number of points that I kind of listed in red there, which you can't quite see on the screen, so it's just flicking across. Cool. I did the calculation underneath, okay, and I knew that I was grabbing marks all the way through that exactly the same for those two other variances exactly the same for price exactly the same for usage if i can go through two or three points explaining the calculation then show the calculation and then talk about what that calculation tells me at the end well i've easily got three four five six seven marks as i work all the way through and suddenly that 22 marks at the top looks a lot more straightforward because we're, we're chipping it down to seven marks and six marks and eight marks. We're pulling the marks out bit by bit. Okay, so total direct material variance, we said can be explained because materials cost more, okay, or because we use more. So number one, now one of the reasons is this price variance. Okay, so that part, of the material variance and then I would use the word could be I can't spell anything this evening could be because the price of materials was more or less than expected. Oh, 
it's not coming through. Wait, wait a minute. Cool. Okay, now what you could have done is you could have put the bit that I did above into, into this part, or you could do you could do it the way that I've done here. And so part of the reason, and you know, we can count, we, we can calculate this as follows. Okay, now the way we calculate it, I'm gonna do the calculation, okay, and, I, and the kind of the calculation that I would do, but if I was doing this as my written question, I would break down the calculation step by step by step. Okay, and I talk about each element of it, okay, and I'd house each element in little sentence and then pull it all together. Okay, but what I'll do here, just to kind of save us a bit of, a bit of time, is go through the calculation. So the material price variance, okay, well price variances are always based on the actual purchases of materials. Okay, so actual purchase of materials. And what do I actually purchase? Well, going back to that original statement, well, I actually purchased 83,000 kilograms. So putting it into my calculation, 83,000 kilograms of materials Okay, so 83,000 kilograms of materials. Did I pay more or less than I expected? So I say 83,000 kilograms of materials should cost 11 pounds each. So working that through, should cost me 913,000 pounds to buy all that material. Okay, so that's what my budget tells me I should have spent on that material. And then I can compare that with 83,000 kilograms of material. Did cost, well they did cost from that statement, 954, 500. So that's a difference, oh, I'm doing that in my head, I think 41,500 pounds. Okay, so we said that what budget tells me, if I'm spending 11 pounds per kilogram, I should have spent 913 grams. However, I actually ended up spending 954,500. I've spent 41,500 pounds more on materials than I expected to. Okay, so you know, I can say I've got this variance or difference. Okay, this means that we spent £41,500 more buying. And if you wanted to, you could put the number in here actually. You could say, right, we're buying 83,000 kilograms of material okay so what we can see that this would have a negative impact on profits okay and we know that we call this kind of variance an adverse variance Okay, it's adverse has a negative impact on profits. We've spent £41,500 more on, on materials than we expected to. We expected to pay £11, we paid more than £11. Okay, now it, it doesn't ask us here, okay, so we, we don't need to do it, but in many exam questions, they ask to tell us reasons for this. So if I've spent more than £11, okay, why could I have spent more than £11? Well, it could be that prices just went up. Okay, it, it may be that, um, that there was some kind of shortage. Um, I have seen questions where our supplier went out of business and we had to find a new supplier, but that new supplier was more expensive. So we had to pay more than 11 pounds. Um, you could, 
you know, always, you know, explain to the examiner that the original budget may have been set at an unrealistic level and £11 was actually far too cheap. So it could be an issue with budgeting. And so any of those things could be reasons why we spent more than £11. Okay, the key thing in understanding the variance is this variance is only about the price paid. Okay, so don't talk, okay, about the fact that, oh, we could have spent more because we used more. Okay, no. Usage we look at differently. Okay, we spent more than eleven pounds. Why might we have spent more than eleven pounds? Okay, we went to the shop and sugar was more expensive. Nothing we could do about it. The price had just gone up. Okay, it could be we thought things were eleven pounds, but when we got to the shop, it actually cost us more than that. It could be we went to the shop. That shop was closed. We went to a different shop, and that shop happened to be more expensive. Okay, it could be that world prices just increased. Okay, so any of those could be reasons. But again, if we start looking at what we've done, we've done, well, we've asked to calculate price variance, we've got a bit here, okay? Part of the variance is due to the price of material being more or less than expected. We can calculate it as follows, okay? I would be talking through this part, I'd be talking through this part. I'd be then looking at this as an explanation of the difference. I would be explaining it, it's got a negative impact on our profits. And before we know it, one, two, three, four, five, six points, Okay, six points, and that's without giving me double credit for heart or two marks for difficult calculations. Okay, so we said here, total material variance can be due to the fact that materials cost more or less than expected. And we've explained the price variance element. Okay, so John just mentioned, Absolutely, Jordan. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Jordan's just made a really good point here. He thinks it's where he's made mistakes in the past, even though it's only asking for the price, it's easy to fall into the trap of going on about potential usage. You are absolutely right. And uh, I, I've, I've taught um, this decision and, Coles, uh, decision and controls paper, uh, uh, this, this version of it, and about three other syllabus before it. I've been teaching for about 15 years or so. And every single time, I teach it, I always ask questions about what could have caused the price variance. And someone always answers me uh, and answers actually something to do with usage. And if you're, if you're saying that, oh, you know, why, why has there been a price variance? And they say, because you use more. So, well, no, no, that, that would be a usage variance. And it, you think you're writing stuff that is answering the question, you're not addressing the question. And unfortunately, the examiners are mean because they do, um, they, they do, you know, if you're not answering the question, they can't, they don't give you credit. They don't say, oh, that's actually a really good answer for something slightly different, so I'll give you some marks because I'm feeling nice. They just don't give you credit for that. Okay, so the other part, which is the other reason, is that we use more or less material than expected. So I'd already done the heading. We use more or less than expected. Okay, so here we had, you know, part of the material variance could be because the price of material is more or less than expected. Well, here, part of the variance, and that's the total variance, could be because we used more or less material than expected. Okay, I know I use the word could, okay, because it could, it's not always the case. Okay, we do sometimes get questions, we do sometimes in reality get situations where, you know, there isn't a use experience or there isn't a price experience. Okay, so price variance just doesn't exist because we agreed a price in advance and we actually hit that price. Okay, usage variances sometimes occur. We say we're going to use a certain amount of material and we use exactly that amount of material. Now, I don't know if anyone here is in, um, in construction or anything like that, but you know, if you're in construction, you're building a house, okay, I would expect that you don't really have any kind of usage variance for things like front doors. You know, if you build a house, it needs one front door. Okay, and you budget for one front door, and I expect you to use one front door. So my variance in terms of front door variance, I'd expect to be zero. I'd expect there to be no variance because you're using exactly what you'd expect to use. Okay, where you're making stuff, I say like cakes or something like that, that's where you could have slight differences. 
So in, in terms of use spend, I say could, is it could, it doesn't always mean that we do. Okay, so could be, because we use more or less as pay, uh, material than expected. And you know, as we've said here, we can calculate it as follows. So again, we can calculate as follows. Okay, so calculating as follows. Well, when we look at usage, we're saying, well, did we use the right amount of material to make our stuff? Okay, so the first thing to know is that, well, we care about what we actually did. So based on actual levels of production, what did we actually produce? Well, that was 21,000 units, and it's what, 21,000? You could even put the name in there, can you? 21,000 decks. Okay, so 21,000 decks were actually produced. And again, I'm going to do the calculation. If I was writing this out in your exam, I would be putting this into, into kind of individual sentences, but just using the calculations as a shorthand, okay, just to get us there. Um, it kind of like so we're not spending huge amounts of time with me just you watch me write down loads of sentences so 21,000 becks and I say well you know what, what should we have done now how much material should we use what did the budget say well the budget said we should use four kilograms per unit so 21,000 times four kilograms that is 84,000 kilograms of raw material so what, that's what I should have done. I should have used for 84,000 kilograms of raw material. But what did I do? Well, 21,000 know, BEX units. They did actually use 83,000 kilograms of material. And I would tell the examiner, I then compared the two. 1,000 kilograms, okay, is my difference. And that means that I can see here that I should have used 84,000, that's what the budget said. So I've used less material than expected. Okay, <coughs> what does that mean? Well, if I'm using less material than expected, I'm not buying as much as I thought. I'm not buying as much as I thought. I'm not gonna be spending as much money. Okay, so this is actually, it's gonna have a positive impact on our profit. Okay, but my profit is in pounds. My profit is never in kilograms. Okay, I've never seen a profit and loss count that says, oh, you made this number of kilograms worth of sales, this amount of kilograms of cost, and this gives me a gross profit in kilograms. Profit and loss counts are always in pounds. So I need to have the pound value. How much is this financial benefit to my profits? Okay, so positive impact on profits. So I need to place a value on this, and I'm gonna value this at what the standard cost of material which is 11 pounds. So 11 pounds per kilogram times by thousands, well that is 11,000 pounds. Yeah, that's a positive impact, we refer to that as a favorable variance. So it's a favorable variance because I've used less than I expected. My profits can be 11,000 pounds better off as a result of using less material than expected. Again, and I don't think we really need to do it right now, okay, but what I'd be expecting in some questions is to then explain how that can happen. Okay, well, what I've used less than expected, I meant to use four kilograms, but I've used less. How could I have used less? Well, there are a number of reasons. So that there could be reasons like, I expected to use four kilograms because I thought there'd be some wastage, and there wasn't wastage. Okay, my, my team were really good. They didn't spill sugar over the floor like I thought they would. And, and it ends up meaning that you know, we didn't need the full amount of four kilograms to make each product. We actually made less because there was less wastage. Um, we've always got the excuse that the budget was wrong. Okay, budget was wrong, maybe. Um, it, it could be, we, I said before, it could be your workforce are really good and they're more efficient and they don't lose stuff and they don't waste stuff. Or 
could be the opposite. It could be a workforce are actually really rubbish and really slack. And what I expect my workforce to do is recognize that something's not going well and there are faulty bits of material in there. They take them out and they just left the faulty bits in, which means they end up not getting rid of damaged parts. So they end up using less kilograms to make their stuff. What I'd expect to see there is the result being a poorer quality product. And I expect to see that somewhere in the question. So lots and lots of reasons. Um, the, the thing that they sometimes ask you about is to say they ask you to come up with reasons. Um, the, the, they occasionally ask you about, is there a link between one variance and another? Uh, and the link between variances are things like, oh, we've got a, we, we've got a, a favorable variance because we spent, or oh, in this case, what is it? It's an adverse variance. We spent less, spent more money on materials. It could be we invested in high quality, high grade materials that are better than ones we were going to buy. And because they're so much better, okay, that means that we don't need to take out damaged bits and throw it away. We can use all the material we buy and that results in a favorable usage variance. So something that examiners sometimes ask us about is the fact that one variance can have an impact on another variance somewhere else. Okay, um, the very last thing that I would do here, the final thing that I would do is I would say if we look at the usage variance of 11,000 pounds favorable and the price variance of 41,500 pounds adverse. If I look at the combined impact of 41,500 bad and 11,000 pounds of good impact on profit, overall that gives me 30,500 pounds. Overall that's favorable, or that's beneficial, or that's good. And this is where the magic happens. This is exactly equal to we go back right to this part here, exactly equal to my total material variance. So that equals my total material variance. So what I've done is I've calculated to start with my total material variance. I've then said this could be because of usage, it could be because of price. I've done the maths, and when I bring the two together, they're exactly equal, and they've exactly explained my total material variance. Okay, so that, I feel, answers this requirement here. Okay, I think if we look here at seven marks for each one of those three elements, seven marks on each, or on each side of the ant, okay, I think we've easily got, okay, I think what we've written there, I think we've got a minimum of five marks for each one of those different parts. I think realistically we've got slightly more than that. I think what we're putting together there, if we're writing in full sentences and you know we've got it nicely broken down, I think we've got a very, very good mark there. I think some people, and it, you know, the real shame is when very, very gifted students okay, miss the ands out. Okay, if you miss the and and say, can you prepare a note explaining the total or direct material variance? Okay, brilliant, you can do it, but they're gonna give you seven marks tops or eight marks tops, and you miss out all of the other parts. Okay, so that absolutely breaks my heart when people miss the and. Missing the and, for me, is the single biggest reason why people don't score the marks that they should do in this question. Okay, then the next thing are, you know, things like Jordan mentioned where you talk about price when you should be talking about usage. Okay, the, the examiner does expect you to understand each of those. Awesome stuff. Right. Just looking at the time, I've just crept over eight o'clock. So hopefully that helps you guys out. Okay, so hopefully that helps you out kind of showing you through that question. Um, I, I do recognize these written questions, as I said earlier, it's the written questions I've had more people email me about over the last kind of like three, four days than absolutely anything else. Okay, so you know, people ask me occasional things about other things, but it's always been the written questions. How do I attack written? questions am i writing the right thing okay so hopefully that helped us out there i will be emailing this recording out over the next kind of 24 hours or so when i email this question this recording out i will also be emailing you the tasks that we'll go through next time so what i might do is i might email you say two or three tasks and we'll look at one of the next time so they're there for you to have a look at um sarah's just asked do you need my email if you have registered 
for this event. So if you went through the registration and you typed in your email address and you kind of got the link sent to you and all those things, I have your email address, okay? If I don't have your email address or you don't think I have it, my email address is David Malthouse at fi.co.uk. So if you can't see that on my video, um, on, my, on my name on the, the participants list, you can see the exact spelling. But if you just uh, just email me that link, say I, I was on your decision and controls evening last night, uh, can you please send me the recording and the exercises that we do next time? I'll get that across to you. Okay, um, so hopefully we found that useful. Thank you so much for the comments. I'll go through them all in a second. So I've just seen there's about 17 there waiting for you to have a look at. Um, so thank you very, very much. If you've got any questions over the next week, feel free to email me. Um, if you've got any friends or kind of colleagues or anyone that's also studying decision and controls, let me know or feel free to let them know about this. Um, my wife, we popped her head in kind of at the beginning of the session, I think some of you saw her, a lady called Kelly. She also runs financial statements, a similar session to this on a Thursday evening. So if you're doing financial statements and you're kind of like trying to keep your knowledge ticking over ready to do the exam, again, let us know and we'll get you booked on that as well. But other than that, have a good evening. Stay safe for the next week and um, hopefully I'll see you all next Tuesday. So thank you very much for coming. Ah, uh, yeah, and uh, Jordan just mentioned it. There is a, a student webinar tomorrow, which is just a general ask any questions about any qualifications. If you wanted to come along to that, again, drop me an email and I can send you a link to it. It's another Zoom meeting, six to seven tomorrow. Uh, we do sometimes get people from the Institute dropping in. But if you've got questions about you know, when exams are going to be running or you know, what you should do study plan wise or anything to do with studying, then just come along, ask us the questions. We should be able to get back to you. So James asked, is there anything like the credit management also as I'm studying both units? Um, I'm not sure. I know that I have got a credit management class that I'm going to be starting to teach in a, in a few weeks' time. Um, and that will be kind of teaching people to just pure knowledge. Um, if we are still in this lockdown position, I will definitely be running a revision session after that finishes just to keep that knowledge updated which again i'll be able to that there's nothing at the moment um the synoptic exam and um, at the moment until we know more detail about synoptic windows i don't know what we're doing about synoptics at the moment because it's it is something that until we know when the windows are happening we'll be doing stuff to the windows um fortunately and it's probably unfortunate for you but i guess fortunately for a lot of people that i that, that we teach um, a lot of people got the synoptics done just before the shutdown so I think there was a synoptic week either one or two weeks beforehand so um, as more and more people get to the stage indirect tax or business tax I desperately want to do an indirect tax one Sonia indirect tax is my all-time favorite unit and I absolutely love it um, so I, there may well be something indirect taxi coming the only restriction that I personally have got is that at the moment I do, I've got different webinars on Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. Um, my only free nights are Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, and apparently my kids want to see me at some point. Okay, otherwise I will do one every single night of the week for everything I possibly can. Um, business tax, watch out for. Okay, there might be something business taxi coming up, but again, just drop, drop me in it, you know, keep an eye out on our Facebook pages. Um, keep an eye in your inbox for emails that come in. Um, there is going to be more stuff that's going to be happening. The longer we're in lockdown, I think the more students that are going to be waiting to sit exams that need to keep their knowledge ticking over. And so there, you know, we'll be running more and more things to help people the longer it runs. The minute we're released and people can start doing exams, okay, then we're kind of on to a more normal study program. Okay, so hopefully that helps you guys. Awesome stuff.